Okay, uh, good afternoon. Sorry uh, for the delay. Welcome to Lunch with Books. Everyone okay? We had some technical issues, obviously. Uh, Every week it's something new. Um, so if you have a cell phone and you, you wouldn't mind turning that off, we would appreciate it. Uh, next week on July the 12th, Renee Nicholson will be here, who's a professor at WVU and has written a book called Fierce and Delicate Ladies. And on Tuesday the 19th at noon, Jason... Kapkala, also a WVU professor, and his book is called Hungry Town, which is a novel. Don't forget that on the 21st of July, our new series called Dinosaurs starts with People's University. If you're one of the first 50, and I'll pass around the sign up again, who signs up and shows up for a class, you will get two free dinosaur books, reference books, and a t-shirt. Pretty good deal. And uh, there'll be professors here, paleontologists from the Carnegie Museums, to teach you all about dinosaurs. And check out our videos. We made a lot of videos that we think are kind of funny uh, to promote the dinosaurs. And so you can see them on Facebook or YouTube. Okay. Also, if you're one of the first 20 who attends all seven of the first seven classes, you get to go on a field trip with us to the dinosaur exhibit at the, at the Carnegie. You get a behind the scenes look from their chief paleontologist. Uh, that'll be on September 8th. Okay. You can win, oh, by the way, uh, free passes to the museums and a gift certificate for $100 to the public market just by taking your picture with one of our dinosaurs and letting us post it online or you post it yourself and use the hashtag I love OCPO. The kids know what the hashtag is. Okay. Our, our guest today filled in kind of at the last minute because I had planned another uh, kind of uh, history program that just didn't work out. I worked hard on it, and it's the hardest I've ever worked on a program that just didn't work out. But we'll get it in the fall, I, I promise. Uh, but he graciously filled in with a subject he's been researching. And that is our old friend, Hal Gorby. He is a teaching associate professor of history and director of undergraduate studies at WVU. Teaches courses on West Virginia history, Appalachian and American immigration. And uh, is the 2021 recipient of the Everly College's Outstanding Teacher Award. And you know, this book is, yeah. Uh, this book is called Wheeling's Polonium. Probably most of you have seen it. Um, he's also appeared on PBS American Experience documentary Mind Wars, and he's spoken at the Ruther Pollock Symposium. He's done many great things. And here he is, Al Gordon. All right. Well, technology is a wonderful thing, isn't it? <laughs> it's been the reality of the last two and a half years for us that we're teaching in college doing things hybrid. So um, well, I'm, I'm glad that Sean, I was able to fill in for Sean at this event that Sean had. And to talk about something that I've been working on for a while, but uh, is this sort of key group in German uh, Wheeling's history uh, that, you know, kind of get flows under the radar a little bit, but is reflective of that sort of height of when Wheeling was a very German place in the mid to late 19th century. Uh, this is the German turn variety. Uh, or the Turner Society or Turner Association. Uh, you may know them as a gymnastics organization. And they're very tied into some of the other sort of social and cultural aspects of what uh, German immigrant communities across the country would have been like in the mid uh, to late 19th century. It's just a little bit of backstory, and most of you know, we've had German immigration to Wheeling. Uh, from the late 18th century through the 19th century. The largest waves arrived right before the Civil War and during the war and sort of the decades immediately thereafter. And by as early as 1850, they've emerged as the city's main ethnic group. 
the principally sort of congregating in North Wheeling, in, in the sort of uh, first ward of North Wheeling. Uh, that's sort of the older group of Germans that arrived, tended to be uh, sort of more middle and upper class by the time of the Civil War. Uh, and then a larger group that arrived after 1848 that largely is more working class craft workers that congregates uh, pretty much around the center market. Uh, like many immigrant groups, they deal with the issues and the fears of immigrants at the time. This is the height of the know-nothings before the Civil War, the concern about particularly Catholic immigrants uh, coming to the country. Uh, and of course, they also, like other immigrant groups, form a variety of social, cultural, we should say religious organizations as well, a mixture of sort of German Jewish, German Catholic, and a number of Protestant uh, faiths as well. And if you look around Wheeling today, you've probably seen a number of uh, churches that have uh, were, were German, were German churches. Uh, unfortunately, because of what happens during World War I, we have very little legacy visually of German Wheeling. Uh, it was largely removed fear about uh, Germans during the First World War. Uh, and that's a shame because we really don't get some of the sense of this sort of vibrant culture that existed. And one of those key societies are the terms. If any of you are active uh, exercise enthusiasts, you should uh, thank the Turner Society for helping popularize various types of popular forms of exercise. But the Turners are much more than just a gymnastic organization. This is really tied up in sort of this nationalistic culture that develops in the German states in the early 19th century. Uh, these early uh, Turnverein clubs uh, were formed as sort of political societies, also to create sort of a martial masculinity supporting the creation of a unified Germany. They also supported a more liberal, open political system as well. Um, early on, they weren't that inclusive. They were kind of elitist in many respects uh, because of their early founder. Uh, but by the 1840s, they had merged and sort of brought in more working class people. And they had become democratic clubs to talk about and complain about the lack of democratic freedoms in the German states. Uh, and the Turners were very influential in, and I don't want to say the foot soldiers, so to speak, but they were very involved on the ground in a series of revolutions in 1848, which did not succeed. These were largely to try to, uh, to open and democratize uh, sort of old European societies across Western Europe. And as a result, many Turners fled and migrated to the United States. And they are, they're called the 48ers uh, in terms of the German immigrant population. And one of the first things they do in the new United States is obviously set up to, uh, Turner societies. Turner societies were sort of a mixture of different things. Uh, they would have they would sing German songs, they would debate political issues. They would, of course, engage in uh, the rings, the sort of uh, sort of the horse, the vault, all the things you think of if you uh, have anybody that ever was involved in gymnastics. Anybody here have any relatives or any of you yourselves involved in gymnastics in any way? A few? Okay. Everything you would think of in terms of the variety of sports, uh, that's something that you would have had at a Turner, a Turner gymnasium. But of course, they also sampled German food, good German drink, of course, and they staged elaborate parades and exhibitions throughout. Uh, their key sort of themes were unity, obviously the unification of Germany, equality of all, a strict sort of manliness, so it's a very masculine social space, and of course, the discipline to keep yourself in good physical shape uh, and to sort of create a good, a good citizenry. Uh, their slogan was, as you can see here, a sound mind and a sound body. So to be good citizens, you have to have a good physical. physical. And of course, they become very politically involved. They're probably some of the most politically involved German immigrants once they arrive. And they support suffrage in the various states across the country. This is at a time when you know, many, uh, many states had very restrictive voting laws. They, of course, were very anti-slavery and supported labor rights as well. I'm going to use a variety of newspaper images that may or may not be that easy to see if you're in the back. Some of the early ones will be a little trickier or trouble making them as I could. Uh, because of the fact we don't have many artifacts of them, we have to rely on things like the newspapers. And as early as 1854, they began holding and publicizing their athletic events. So this is from November of 1854 
talking about a uh, sort of a series of expeditions. They would do individual competitions. So indiv if you ever go to a gymnastic meet, individual sort of rankings of people, which you can kind of see uh, in this list here. And they would also do team exercises as well. Uh, you can also see there at the bottom that they also had a prize for oration. So this mixture of the various aspects of their German identity is what you would have seen uh, if you went to one of those term halls. And as you'll notice in some of these lists of names, you'll notice some pretty prominent people in Wheeling's history. Uh, notice, for example, uh, he didn't come in first place for either, but uh, Louis Stifel Jr., the famous Calico Wars. Around the same time, German immigrants and, and uh, people in the Turner Society also formed the German Rifles uh, in February of 1855. It was a German militia company, uh, so kind of building off that sort of martial spirit as well. Uh, and you start seeing more increasing ads promoting the types of events that the Turners were holding throughout uh, Wheeling. So here in the summer of 1857, Fritz, Fry, and Frolic. Very elaborate too. Uh, highlighting how fun it is to be a member of the Turner Society. Uh, the Wheeling Daily Intelligencer actually wrote one of its earliest full articles on the Turner Society and noted that, oddly enough, native-born residents, quote, probably know nothing about the group. I doubt that, but the writer didn't seem to think that he knew much about them. Um, noting that they promote manly, vigorous, muscular exercise, the chief aim of the Turners was, quote, to nourish manly independence in the light of humanity and social uh, and so you can see here through a list of some of the types of activities that they would have been doing. Also notice the regular programs. They would have sang a variety of uh, prominent music. So Mendelssohn. Uh, I, I, I particularly like the third one is a Turkish drinking song. I really want to know what that is. Um, uh, but again, this also reflects when we think of these groups at this time in Wheeling, we think there's German singing societies over here. We think the saloon culture that's heavily German is something different. The Turners are a good organization that shows these are all intertwined together. Uh, and people that are involved in one are often involved in others. You can also see that their first meeting space, it's a little hard to see there, was the Melodian Hall. Uh, Melodian Hall was a space that was located on 1220 Main Street. Uh, today it's a parking lot. That's catty corner across from where DeCarlo's Pizza is today. Would have been the first hall. Fun abound, fun ahead. The Turner Association respectfully announced to the public that engaged with the well-known Roman brothers. Okay. And the first expedition will consist of a grand concert, general tumbling, vaulting, it's friendly, a splendid living picture. That was a common phrase you can see, this sort of living picture, like creating through movement, through exercise, uh, the various sort of uh, exhibitions. They tried to make their events relatively cheap as well to attract a much wider and I should say, they were very politically oriented, so openly anti-slavery. Most Turners were uh, members of the developing Republican Party at that time, although there were many in the Democratic Party as well. So by 1867, they had outgrown the use of the, the hall there on Main Street, and they purchased a former Presbyterian church in North Wheeling that had been built in, in 1832 or 1833. Uh, located at 909 Market Street for everyone here and everyone joining us online. If anybody ever finds a picture of this building in this full block, if it has Turner Hall on top of it, I would love to see it. But I've looked for a long time and it's very hard to find, as we'll see. Uh, they had converted the church into an elaborate auditorium with a 28-foot deep stage, floodlights, drop curtain scenery. And in the basement, there was a large dining hall and where the gymnasium was located. They would also rent the hall out for various political, social clubs, and other events. And from 1868, really until 1917, it was a key uh, social meeting house, a social site, political rally place uh, in the city of Wheeling. Uh, when they were formed, as you can see here, they were for the purpose of performing and teaching gymnastic experiences for promoting morality and anything else generally connected with all the terms. The early incorporators really reflect a, uh, a sort of diverse working class base. Uh, people that were involved in various types of factories and small businesses around town. And many of them also served in the German rifles and also served in the Civil War with the Union Army. 
Some of them were more prominent members of the community as well. One of the key figures throughout this period is August Rolf, uh, who was born in 1828 in Hanover and came to Wheeling in 1846. Rolf was engaged in various tailoring and other businesses and eventually got into the saloon trade of Congress way to rise for German immigrants. Uh, in the 1850s, he became a first lieutenant of Company C of the German Rifles, uh, which was part of the Virginia State Militia. And they were actually dispatched to deal with John Brown, among uh, many other things. Later, he joined the 2nd Regiment of the West Virginia Infantry during the Civil War. And when he came back to Wheeling, he involved himself in a number of restaurants and saloons. He operated it uh, one near the Grand Opera House for and like many other German immigrants at the time, he rose through the sort of economic ranks and was involved in a number of other types of businesses, the German insurance company, the German bank, which we associate with our friend Henry Schmolbach, of course, uh, the Wheeling and Elmgrove Railroad, and for a period of time in the 1880s, was a manager at Wheeling Park. He was also on the county commission, among many other things. And again, was a member of the Turners, the Aryan Association, and of course, the Opera Orchestra. Lived a long life, by the way, for that time. So again, those physical German spaces that we see throughout Wheeling had a lot of a carryover with people who were involved in the Turners. And the Turners were sort of a cross-class organization. A lot of working class members, but also a lot of very, very prominent people, as we'll see. When you see some of these lists, it's, it's the height of Wheeling culture and society. So just to give you a sense of here, here are the key sort of members of the committee uh, organizing the uh, 1866 Turner Festival. G. George W. Franzine, August Rolf, Anton Raymond. These are very prominent figures. And in, in its early days, these Turner Festivals would be these large elaborate events where they would show off these various gymnastics competitions, teach people how to do them as well. They tended to be early on in July, and then they moved to being in October. <laughs> Think of the common association with Oktoberfest, for example. So again, that hall that opens in 1868 at 909 Market Street uh, helped in celebrating around mid-October uh, the Turners and this new space. When they would hold these festivals, these wouldn't just be one-day events. These would be three-day events, four-day events. So October 14th, they had a grand concert and expedition joined by the Harmony and Manic Choir Singing Societies. On the 15th, they had a grand fair and festival. And on the 16th, a picnic at the fairgrounds in Wheeling. And as you can see, you're describing the hall. It is thinly fitted up, has a very nice and large stage, and affords ample room for more than 1,000 spectators. This is a massively large hall for that time in Wheeling's history. Uh, if, if you look at city directories at the time, it's listed as one of the principal halls or meeting spaces. In, in. And the basement contains the bar and dining rooms, and of course, a room from gymnastic exercises. I just love this setup. This is how bars should be set You have the bar on one side, you got the gym on the other side, so you can drink and then work off what you drank and you can drink some more. And it's a great mix. It's a great mixture. Now, for those of you trying to physically imagine this, and I apologize, I wish I had a great clear photo of this, the Turner Hall would have been physically located next door to the M.M. Marsh Stogie Building, which we still have. Um, it's, it's no longer there, but in this 1931 picture, you can kind of see a little bit of it, uh, but not very clearly. It's literally right next door. Uh, it's 909 Market Street, and the Marsh Building the building is 911. Now, and Sean's going to get after me because I'm going to walk up here real quick. So this is from the 1890 Sandborn map. It's, it's kind of showing you 10th Street, 9th Street, uh, and it's located in this general area. Uh, it's a little bit difficult to see here in 1890, but in 1902, it's a little more easier to see. So if you're going across the Port Henry Bridge today, you might see that sort of apartment structure that has like a sort of horseshoe shape. It was literally located to a catty corner to the right behind it. So in that open space back there is where it would have physically uh, been located, sort of facing towards the hillside. And as I have said already, the Turners, well, they like to have elaborate celebrations. So 
1866 Turn, Turn Variety Festival was probably the first large scale Turn Fest, as they were called. Uh, like I said, they did things big. So this is giving you a sense of the entirety of the program, uh, which lasted for, uh, for several days. Ticket prices were relatively uh, sort of well, uh, sort of within people's uh, reasonable expectations. The president of the festival that year was George Franzon. And they would hold a large festival, and this one's important because it's not just for the Turners of Wheeling. This is the first time that they're actively serving as sort of the site for the wider Turn Variants of the Western Pennsylvania, sort of Eastern Ohio region. And as the print newspaper noted at the time, quote, the class of citizens represented by the Turners Association are among the most valued members of our society, which is quite true. They had a massive parade uh, and carried, you know, the bunting of the United States. And as noted in many newspaper accounts, the black, red, and gold of the Germanic Confederation. This is prior to the unification of Germany. And much drinking, singing, and engagement happened as well, followed by a grand ball. The Turners were also influential in a number of events to try to promote this wider German culture that's happening in a transatlantic sort of fashion across uh, Europe and the United States. And so they are key in organizing a large festival honoring the 100th birthday of Alexander von Humboldt, uh, who was a noted German scientist and geographer. Building off of their success in 1866, they, along with the various singing societies, organized uh, this massive celebration throughout town, starting with a variety of vocal and instrumental music at the Turner Hall, followed by songs from the various German singing societies. Turners were led by Mr. Dryhorst and a number of young German-American students. Quote, the skill and agility exhibited by these amateur gymnasts was wonderful and excited astonishment and admiration. So imagine them, they're having parades where they're showing off some of their skills. They were showing off exhibitions where they can set up their all equipment and other sort of uh, gymnastic uh, feats. The morning processional through Wheeling was headed by the Turners and a variety of German assistants and Germania societies uh, with a bust of Humboldt carried in a wagon. The parade grand marshal was George Franzheim and other leading Germans in the parade were, you can see on this screen, Augustus Pollock, Anton Raymond, George Zockler, among many other prominent Wheeling Knights. Uh, they had a grand parade that ended at the Wheeling uh, Fairgrounds on Wheeling Island and they had a, a proclamation read by West Virginia Governor William Stevenson at the time. Remember, this is the height of Wheeling as the, also the state capital of West Virginia as well. While tired from the day's festivities, of course, the Wheeling Intelligencer noted, quote, a wagon filled with empty kegs returning in the evening showed that if the day had not been an enjoyable one, it was not for lack of the proper inspiration. They can, so. <laughs> they gotta make this stuff fun, too. Make, make, it, make it interesting. But I hope you're seeing the rising prominence that they're playing here uh, and having these large ceremonies where the city, state government that's housed in Wheeling is also promoting these events. Uh, the, the Germans are sort of, they have risen to the echelon, the tops of Wheeling society in terms of its manufacturing merchant class. And this is highlighted as well by the 1871 peace celebration with the end of the Franco-Prussian War. I find it ironic that they had called it a peace celebration when so it was probably, it was a little bit of a too. Uh, they took the lead in this celebration as well, and this uh, was marshaled by August Rolf. And they had another massive parade. This is the era of massive parades. People had parades for everything at this time. You know, the Turners were often spearheading many of these types of events. The event started off with a 100-gun salute in the morning, uh, and while the procession marched through Wheeling. Uh, as you can see here, here's the order of the march itself. And again, you know, Augustus Pollock, Anton Raymond, German-American flags, and all of the downtown businesses throughout the business district would have been draped in both American flags and uh, the, German, uh, the German colors as well. And you notice the overlap between the German singing societies and, of course, uh, the, Turner, the Turners as well. And they, they also organized Germans throughout, so they had three groups. One was made up of the Germans of North Wheeling and Wheeling Island met at the Turner Hall. Then they had the Germans of East Wheeling, which was led by Augustus Pollock and Anton Raymond. And then, of course, the more working class communities of South, Center and South Wheeling. 
And on, and interesting enough, the, they, they had a large banquet at the Turner Hall. And then when they finished that night, the main sort of business establishments, particularly German business establishments, stayed illuminated all night long. Which may not sound like a lot today, but at a time when that's difficult to do, that shows just how much clout, how much clout they had. Again, just showing you another example from 1878. Each one of these events through the 1860s and 1870s, they held these pretty annually up until about the mid-1880s or so. Uh, and they all followed a pretty standard pattern that we've kind of seen established up to this point. Uh, this one, for example, I want to highlight here the image on the right, where it, in, the, in some more detail goes into some of the types of exercises that were on display. Swinging of Indian clubs, fencing with foils, Dumbbell exercises, which by this point, they're starting to mix not just the gymnastics exercises, but what we would call weight training uh, as well. Foot races, pyramids, lance throwing, um, you know, sort of all the sort of key things you would associate with uh, the gymnastics. They had long jump, high jump as well. So it would be like going to a track meet, a modern sort of track meet. Just some other images to show you sort of the prominence of the Turners here in Wheeling. They were always holding expeditions to teach these exercises to mix the variety aspects of culture as well. And they also held dancing events as well, masquerade balls. They liked to have a good time, and at a time when there wasn't a lot of sort of cheap and readily accessible entertainments, uh, the Turners obviously provided. And here again, we see a little bit of a description of some of their exercises, horizontal and parallel bars, the building of pyramids. I hope everybody knows what I'm talking about, like the human pyramids. This would be one of the key things they would show off in these festivals is people stacking a human pyramid. Pretty high, uh, actually. This is from Chicago, but just kind of gives you a nice image of sort of what a gym space would look like. So you can see some of the rings. You can see them standing on their hands and their feet up in the air. Uh, you know, obviously trying to build a human pyramid there in the foreground. And, these, and as time goes on, one of the natural things that starts to happen in the Victorian era, we start seeing other forms of entertainment start to develop. Amusement parks, think of Mozart Park, Wheeling Park. These are starting to develop in the 1880s, 1890s, and so people are finding amusements in different ways. And also by this point, the German... Uh, population has entered its second and third generation as well. So to try to continue the spirit of the turn for Ryan, uh, the organization shifted gears in the 1880s and started expanding its physical uh, education classes, we would probably call them. Uh, and this really happens throughout the last couple of decades of the 19th century, where they would hold demonstrations on workout equipment and teach people the benefits of exercise. Not just that it's fun, but it's actually good for your health in a city that, you know, people, you know, lifespan wasn't nearly what it is today. Um, and so they would show very prominent exhibitions. So for example, in December of 1884, they had a large one for the city where people came and saw uh, people using the various equipment. Um, and, and beginning in 1889 with the arrival of Professor Crow, uh, who was trained in the Milwaukee uh, sort of uh, term Orion sort of uh, education, you know, their sort of gymnastic union that operated out of Milwaukee, they began offering a physical training school for young children. So again, this is part of this outreach to try to you know, get inspire new generations of people to join the organization. And by 1892, uh, they had about 200 children, children attending daily classes, obviously not doing the full exploits of the exercises, but uh, doing pretty close to it. And they had about 150 members, but their membership has started to decline uh, by this point. They built a more spacious clubhouse, they expanded the gymnasium, and they also added apartments, you know, to get some extra, extra revenue as well. Uh, and, as, and I love this quote that the, the sort of wheeling paper noted of the school uh, at that time. How delightful and cheerful does it make one to see the little fellows or maidens run and jump with the ease of a deer, and then again to see the hard muscular work of the men while the perspiration flows freely from the forehead of the participants. It is an hour of your life well spent to participate in gymnasium work. 
So this is also trying to sort of promote what the benefits of fitness are. You know, visitors are welcome. This is not just a German space. They are broadening it out to the wider, wider population. Now, you're probably asking yourself, this is a very masculine society. And as things start to change in the 1880s and 90s, you start seeing more discussion of classes for women. The earliest examples I have found are in the early 1890s. Here are a couple examples from 1891, one noting a woman, a lady social. The other one, uh, the professor asking for a retraction in the newspaper after a young woman from Elm Grove uh, got hurt doing physical activity and blamed it on the term. Uh, I wanted to make it very clear that she wasn't in one of the classes. This, I think, reflects some of the anxiety about the Uh, but they start trying to reach out to have more types of clubs and uh, sort of uh, physical training classes for, for women as well. But I think this is also reflected. One of the more amusing and fun things for me, because we just finished up the NBA championship recently, is around the same time, they're trying to also bring in American types of sports as well. And in the 1890s, they became one of the, I would say, the promoter of what the press referred to as basketball. There's purposely a space there for the, throughout the decade. The Turners were the main promoters of the hard, uh, hardwood sport throughout this time period, and it was the Turners who started the first organized team and teaching how to play basketball in Wheeling. They, their gymnasium was one of the few places you could actually play at this time. H. Herman Friedrichs, who later would open a sort of uh, large sporting goods store in Wheeling, was the sort of main team organizer and coach now. And the team started in 1896. Uh, it was doing quite well in 1897. By 1898, Friedrichs was trying to organize a more permanent league uh, citywide. Citywide, there were only three teams, the Turners, which were the top team. There was the Crescents, a team of young men from Wheeling Island, and the uh, Wheeling Athletic Club sponsoring team as well, although it was soon to be expanded. Uh, at the time, Friedrichs and others noted the problem with expanding the popularity of the sport was the fact that Wheeling lacked a proper arena to hold a basketball court. Uh, Lindsley Academy was one location, but obviously out of downtown Wheeling. Uh, there were several other places. The YMCA wanted to try to have a gym, but theirs wasn't large enough to, to have a full-size basketball court. But the Turners were one of the early promoters of basketball. And they're, as we've seen, they're fitting into this wider German culture as well. So, uh, and I know Sean and his programs before have talked about the Sanger Fest. So think of the Sanger Fest as building on and sort of in a symbiotic relationship with these annual Turner festivals as well. Uh, while these were led by the German singing societies, those singing societies were actively involved in these Turner uh, festivals as well. Uh, so members of both would be sort of uh, you know, involved in both organizations. And this creates a common practice of these large German American festivals, the decorating of downtown business spaces. And again, it just kind of reflects how much of a German city Wheeling was. Uh, this image, by the way, is a front cover image from 1910, I believe, of the Deutsche Zeitung newspaper here in Wheeling. So just to give you a sense of how uh, active uh, these societies have been in the greater world of Wheeling. And so the Turner festivals naturally feed into the growing prominence for German Day Event, or Deutscher Tag. The first uh, real large example of this uh, happened in 1883 on the 200th anniversary of the first German settlement in America. And again, these were another type of unifying symbol, bringing all the different German organizations together for a common cause to celebrate their common heritage. Uh, as you can guess, when did these start being celebrated? Early October coinciding with what we now know as Oktoberfest. Although some of them would often be held in August, September, eventually the conference would be uh, held in uh, early October. And these German Day events uh, at the time are, you know, this is the height of German wheeling. And in, in, in description of the German Day in 1900, the Wheeling Daily Intelligencer noted the following. 
German Day has nothing to do with politics or parties. More than anything else, German Day is a patriotic affair, more commemorative of what happened in America than in Germany. We are proud that the German settlers landed on American soil and how the dash encouraged to open up an untrodden wilderness to civilization, bringing with them industries, teachings, and feelings that this is our country by adoption. So noting the prominence they've played in the economic sphere and social sphere. Uh, within less than 20 years, this type of statement would have been heresy in the local newspaper uh, because being German by that time uh, would have been seen as something bad. Uh, and it's odd that at the time this, this, the German days festivals are becoming more prominent is at the time the Turners are born. And I know I can't really pinpoint myself. I'd be interested to hear your ideas about this, why they're falling out of prominence at the time. Is it you know, generational change. I think some of it has to do with the wider cultural amusements and other things that are available at the time. I also think something has, you know, something to be said for that uh, growing into German scene. Um, so, of course, I have to note the decline. Uh, the decline started around 1900, although I think it was starting a bit before then, and that was why they were doing this wider outreach. Um, music historian Edward C. Wolf notes that he, he dates it to 1900. And more so in 1906, when the hall was leased to C.D. Thompson to start as a theater to show vaudeville productions. Uh, by 1916, uh, J.M. Crane, working for the Miami Amusement Company, was running a motion picture house. Uh, but, you know, they got into some trouble. They were not paying their rent to the Turner Association and still technically owned the building. Uh, and so the, the, the organization was constantly in financial trouble. But throughout this period, they hosted events. 1914, they hosted a German-American event at the start of World War I, which would have been heresy three years later. Uh, in, the, in 1916, they hosted political rallies for uh, prominent African-American Republicans statewide. In 1928, they hosted a rally for West Virginia Republican Senator Guy Goff, who was thinking of running for president. He didn't. Uh, but just to show that this site was still being used for other things, but just not for the gymnastics uh, sort of exhibitions of the previous era. Uh, they still held sporting events as well. One of the funniest ones I've come across is from the summer of 1908, a competition between Carl Busch, who was noted as the German champion, and Bob Manigoff, known as the terrible. And in some respect, it mirrored some of the aspects of that uh, sort of gymnastic culture before Greco-Roman style wrestling, wrestling, and one of the matches using a half Nelson and other types of tactics that probably would have been taught uh, in some of those Turner uh, educational classes. Turner Hall is still listed in city directories as late as 1913, 1914. Uh, but by 1917, it makes its dramatic transformation uh, when the hall is leased uh, by the Hawthorne Automobile and Equipment Company for about $4,000. The company planned to remodel and convert it into a garage, a display, and a, a sales room for automobiles. Uh, now, that seems to be an odd moment. It may be, but June of 1917, the height of the World War I climate here uh, in New so it's maybe appropriate that that's the moment when this transformation happens. Uh, and the site exists there as an automobile dealership for a period of time. It still has you know, meeting spaces that are happening in the 20s. And in 1941, the Marsh Company purchased the site. Historian Edward Wolfe, as late as 1888, when he published an article in Upper High Valley Historical Review, noted the following of the site. Quote, the exterior walls and second floor front windows survive today, and it must be one of the oldest and most remodeled buildings in downtown Wheeling. Remember, it dates from 1832. So sometime after 1988, the site was formally uh, demolished, uh, sort of losing that long history of sort of expeditions of physical strength, German singing, and the robust German culture. Uh, well, thanks, everybody. I'll take some questions if you have. Uh, 
Their full name that they go by until about the 1860s is the term variety. The term variety, sort of like it, it, it's it's a spade. It's sort of reflecting the fact that it's a club. A variety is like a club, so a social organization. Or a club. It, 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 it has to do with the description of the exercises. So the idea that you're turning your body, you're sort of doing these movements, you're turning, you're sort of on the vault equipment, you're turning yourself. So think of it as a turner, you would do turns. That's the way they would describe it. They would say you're doing gymnastic turns. Brian, you know, you'd cry or Brian, you'd have other sort of social organizations. Think of it. Brian's more like a fraternal organization. That advertisement is from 1988? That's from 1917 when it opened as the Hawthorne Automobile Company. Because I see this restroom for women that's noted there. Mm -hmm. Well, and again, the other common, the reason I end with this quote is that one of the common things you keep hearing and you see in these articles that I've come across is how many different things the site was every time they wanted to change it. Uh, you know, it was a Presbyterian church. So they converted a church into an auditorium with a gymnasium and a bar. And then they converted that into a, an automobile dealership with a garage. I do think there is an interesting public history there, and that's why it pains me that I don't have any images of the building itself. So if anybody, maybe middle note, 909 Market Street, the 900 block of Market Street, if anyone ever comes across any photographs, I would be willing to see. Um, if you go there today, it's just an open, it's an open lot next to Marshall. Yes. Turner's professed to be anti-slavery during the Civil War. Like the, Northern did. So even before the war, the, the organization, it's er, it dates to about 1853 in Wheeling. And from pretty early on, they are fairly vocal in being anti-slavery. Uh, and that's part of that sort of influence of the 1848 revolutions. Uh, they would often get in scuffles. Uh, with sort of nativist groups, uh, not so much because they were German, but often because of that sort of stated anti-slavery position. Uh, and as I, as I mentioned, some of the early people, they, they are also members of that German rifle company. Most of them, I, I can't mention how many of them, it comes up that they were veterans of the Union Army. They were prominent Republicans, or they were involved in some way in uh, the creation of West Virginia. You know, so that the, the, these wider political views are important. Now, as time goes on, it's more of a bipartisan organization. You know, members are in the Republican and in the Democratic parties. Yes. No. Newspaper coverage is the best source of it, where we can get lists of people in terms of how they finished in competitions. So, but again. They're wanting to promote success. So unlike, you know, it's not like a participation award where we're going to list every single person. They're going to list the people who came in the top 10. Usually, and that's all we get uh, on a regular basis. Uh, what what was, is striking to me is when you read those names, you get so many of them. You know, early on, one of the most prominent Turner athletes was Lewis Stifel's son. He was very prominent. Many other prominent people in Wheeling society, their children were on the Turners, and many of them, if they arrived in the 1840s or 1850s, they themselves were Turners uh, actively as well. So uh, it would be great to have the physical documentation. Like anything else, when an organization closes and no one donates or collects the papers, this is what we have. This is why this has been so hard to put this together. Yeah, that's part of it as well. I mean, they weren't they weren't really rivals early on because YMCA was, you know, obviously not a, a German immigrant organization. So it's like they're doing one sort of element of that gymnastic society. Whereas YMCA, I think when you get into the 1870s, 1880s, they're definitely starting to become com competitors. I think they're starting to win over more of that membership of sort of the second, third generation of people that are German Americans. Partly because they offer more than just the standard German gymnastics training. 
So one of the things the Turners start going in the 1890s, you start seeing, we're going to teach you how to do dumbbell training. We're going to teach you how to play basketball. We're going to train and do classes that we would now associate with. That's what you get at the YMCA. That's what you I was in YMCA and MCA basketball leagues here. You know, that was, I would never have thought that that was something first done by a German athletic association. Yeah. Were there uh, originating societies in Germany? Mm -hmm. And they, uh, so were they associated with them? And, yep. And, or did these just pop up? In the yeah, they, the, the earliest date of them is to about, and I cut some of this out because we already started a little bit late, but they start around 1811 or so in the Napoleonic Wars period. And the idea of when they're started is that they're trying to create martial individuals who may have to be in the military. So the idea that these might be sort of junior officers in the German. Its earliest founder is sort of controversial because he was he was anti-Semitic, sort of controversial in that respect. It was a very elitist sort of the officer corps, and then by the 1840s, it starts to become this more inclusive society. And that's partly why in the 1860s period in Wheeling, you see them having events where they're promoting events in Europe. So they're making these clear linkages to what's going on in Europe. Whereas by the 1880s, you don't really see them doing. They're not having these large festivals anymore. They're, you know, they've become very Americanized by that. Point. Yeah. And did the whole thing quit with World War One? They quit well before World War One, uh, and that's the interesting part of this. Like, if I just do, I've done a variety thanks to Library of Congress's Chronicling America. This makes this a lot easier. Uh, you do not find many references at all for the Turners as a gymnastic organization after nineteen. If you see it come up, it's the hall itself is coming up, or the Turner Association comes up uh, as they're leasing the building to have the vaudeville theater, have the motion picture house. So it's kind of like that original generation, which they founded in the 1850s, officially incorporated in 1867, 1868. They are old men by this point, and so they're wanting to use the space for anything they can. They still had the gym. They still had the bar. They had apartment buildings. You, the other most common thing you find advertisements for are the various apartments in the building as well. So it was like a very multi-purpose uh, space. But I, the latest I see, early 1900s, it stopped being what it traditionally was. Another online question. Wanting to know if they uh, have any They were very active in the Civil War. Many of them either were members of the German Rifles or they joined other uh, sort of German units during the war. Many of the Wheeling Turners, I would say, joined uh, West Virginia regiments in the Civil War, whether it be artillery, cavalry, or infantry. Uh, but, you know, that reflects that early martial muscular sort of role that they're playing, um, you know, dating back from that sort of association in Europe. Any photographs, I would be in your deck. Yeah. Can you read that line right above where it says restoration river? What's it say? I can't read it. Uh, the most modern, uh, new in our sales room for your inspection. So the idea that you can actually. Right underneath it. Next oh. line. No, but by in between. Now in our sales room for your inspection. Okay. I'm interested in the name of the car. Yeah. You know who that's named after, don't you? Hawthorne? No, no. Roy Harun. Harun. He's the man that won the first Indianapolis 500 mm -hmm. in a car called the Wasp. And they, they accused him of cheating because he didn't have a mechanic on board. He had something else. It was called a rear view mirror. Wow. Uh, yeah. And he saved all his weight. And they, they said he won part because he didn't have to bear that extra. Mechanic, you know, it's an interesting thing that they transitioned to an automobile dealership too, because if you know that physical location, that you know that's near now the suspension bridge, suspension bridge, Fort Henry Bridge. So it's a very high traffic uh, area as well. Um, you know, so again, it's a site that went from a church to a gymnasium, bar, social hall to automobile garage. And that one building you showed earlier in your presentation. German Fire Insurance Company. That building still exists. 
used to be where the stock exchange was in Wheeling, right across the streets in the court theater. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we do have some of those physical spaces still around. But again, if anybody can find. Is that the building on the left is what you're talking about? I'd have to ask Sean because the orientation of the building had me a little bit confused. So it would be if 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 we were or if we're coming across the Fort Henry Bridge and Marsh Wheeling is here, it's on the left hand side. So I'm not I'm not I've got myself turned around here. I'm not exactly sure. But when I saw this picture, I went, well, it's either it's on one side of this building. Is that where they're going to build the new uh, parking facility that they're going to be mm -hmm. on that parking lot? Beside the building with the weedy jamboree, the old eagle. Again, if anybody can find pictures of that block, I would be in your debt because it would be. If it has Turner or Turnverein on it, that would be even better. And even if it's something else, that would be. That would be. The, 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 I, 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 I have been working diligently to find a picture, and last night I was like, you're just not. It's a wild Just not. Have you ever tried talking to Tony for me? Be a good idea. He brought a book out recently and he came here for a presentation. I bought a copy of it and I looked at it. Um, postcards and wheelies. See, Kodak used to encourage people to make their own postcards. Might be in some of the postcards. Yeah. And he has a collection of those. And he very well may have a picture of that particular building. That someone took standing in front of him or something. Great. Well, thanks everybody. I appreciate your time. Thank <laughs> you.